have dozens of, of great memories and great stories of my times with Bruce. Uh, and I'll share some of them with you. Uh, I've shared some of them in some of my books, but for those who haven't read my books, you can... Uh, I'll share some of them on this, on this video. Uh, Bruce was quite a showman, and he loved it when he was, he was the center of attention, and he always was when he was demonstrating his kung fu. And uh, while I was making Wild Rovers, the Western at MGM Studios, uh, Blake had asked me uh, if I would be interested in bringing Bruce Lee down to the, to the set at MGM. And the reason, one of the reasons was because Blake wanted to meet him. Blake had met him initially in 1964 at the Internationals where Blake uh, presented the, uh, the Grand Championship Award to, uh, with Ed Parker to Mike Stone. And it was there that, that, uh, that Bruce had given his, his legendary uh, demonstration. But I don't believe, as I recall, that Blake hadn't seen Bruce from that point until 1970. And he, Blake knew that I was working with Bruce and that I knew him and spending time with him. But the other reason was that it was Ryan O'Neill. Ryan O'Neill was one of the stars of, of uh, Wild Rovers. And Ryan had a, a similar history to Bruce. Only he was a little bit ahead of him in, in, his, in his own uh, timeline. Uh, Ryan had done a, a lot of, of uh, television. Ryan was a good-looking guy. He was a Malibu surfer. He grew up in Los in West L.A. He was blonde, blue-eyed, uh, in great physical shape. Uh, he was a boxer, an amateur boxer. He did a, a lot of amateur boxing. He was a good boxer. He was a good athlete. But he got roles and uh, started out in small roles in television. You'll see him occasionally in bit parts on the Twilight Zone and little... TV roles, and then he landed a role on a on a, ser on a series uh, Peyton Place, which was which was very popular, but it was still television. It was a regular series, much like uh, Bruce on the Green Hornet. Only only Peyton Place ran for some time, uh, and then he got the big break. Just the way Bruce, three years later, would have the huge break with uh, Enter the Dragon. Um, for Ryan, the big break was Love Story. Love Story broke and on, was uh, uh, actually premiered uh, throughout the United States on Christmas Day of 1970. And overnight, Ryan became a superstar. That film was a big, huge hit, just like Enter the Dragon. And uh, so Ryan was feeling his oats. I mean, he was really, he was really into it. And I used to talk to him. Ryan and I, and I became friends, and we're still good friends. And, and um, because of his background in boxing and my background in martial arts, we'd have, sometimes we'd have these discussions. And at that time, Ryan was uh, managing, was a part owner and manager of a boxer named Hedgemon Lewis. Hedgemon had had a degree of success, and Ryan was managing and had an ownership him in him with uh, Bill Cosby and uh, a few other actors, as I remember. And he was very big on Hedgeman Lewis and boxing. And uh, I thought that was great, but I thought, I thought it'd be nice if uh, Ryan would meet Bruce, which he agreed to do. He said, yeah, if he comes by the, the soundstage or anyone, sure, I'd love to say hello. I'd love to meet him. Ryan was a very personable guy, always very personable. And so uh, the appointed day arrived, and Bruce Lee came down to MGM and walked onto the sound stage where we were shooting. And during one of the breaks, I introduced Ryan to Bruce, and they got to talking. And Ryan said, "Oh, I understand. Yeah, you you box." He said, "Yeah, I box." And they got to down, and Bruce did what he did to me, and he's done to everybody—not everybody, but a lot of people. He looked at Ryan and he said, uh, "Try to hit me." Now Ryan, I got to tell you, was six foot. One, uh, hundred, I want to say 185, 190 pounds, a big guy and an athletic guy. He really, really towered over Bruce Lee. You know, it was, it was, you know, quite a difference in their size. And Ryan kind of looked at him like, like, you know, are you serious? You, 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 he said, yeah, go ahead. And uh, 
So Ryan did. He kind of bounced around a little bit as a boxer, and then he kind of did a little jab. And he was he wasn't getting much of anywhere, and all of a sudden Bruce just cut loose, and Bruce uh, uh, went after him and uh, uh, really playfully, but to make a point. And within a matter of seconds, Ryan would, had bent over at the waist and had his hands over his head, and he was saying, "I had enough. That's enough. That's enough. I've had enough." And uh, he stood up and looked at Bruce like, my God, what was that? What happened? How did, how did that end? I'll tell you exactly what happened. Uh, Bruce jammed his front leg, uh, and he got on. He broke out to the, out to the side of, of Ryan and jammed his front leg, and he, uh, he, he positioned himself so he controlled the center line through the side of, of, uh, of Ryan, and he did what Bruce calls blasting. He just went right over Ryan's shoulder and just started pounding on him, lightly tapping him on the head, but he could have punched him in the face. Every now and then he would deliver a body shot and he'd buckle his knee. And I mean, it was just, it was just a, a <laughs> tidal wave of punches and he never kicked him. And uh, Ryan was impressed. And uh, Bruce said, well, you've seen the hands and you've seen, you know, this, uh, we do have, also have, you know, kicks. And uh, he got a hold of a, of a pad of some kind. I think it was something that one of the stuntmen had. And he told Ryan to hold on his chest, and Ryan did, and uh, Bruce delivered a sidekick to that big pad, and uh, Ryan flew backwards and slammed into uh, the, uh, the side of a trailer. And uh, I remember, you know, Ryan just stood, he just looked at Bruce and he said, I have never been kicked so hard by anyone in my life. It got his attention. Blake Edwards told me later on that he thought that that, that kick was the beginning of, of Ryan's back trouble that he had for years. I don't know if that's true. That was just Blake's opinion. And uh, But that was Ryan's meeting with, uh, with Bruce. And they became friends after that. And uh, they had a great mutual respect for each other. They both very much the same personality. Had great, great sense of, of senses of humor and and uh, they, they're both very charming. A lot, you know, a lot of charisma. I could see where they would get along quite well, and they did. In all the uh, the time I was around Bruce, I never knew him to be a bully. Uh, and he could have been. He could have. Uh, he could have been a bully if he wanted to. But I never knew him to be a bully. But every now and then he would have to exert some authority in order to. Uh, to rectify a situation that he thought was uh, needed to be addressed. And I was at the Santa Monica School one Saturday, uh, and at that time Dan Inosanto uh, was teaching um, a kids' class. Danny was the first one to have a kids' class uh, in the Kempo system. And he had a, a wonderful class. It was, it was, it was uh, a lot of kids came, and Danny was great with them. He even entered a, a group of kids into the internationals, the Long Beach internationals, one year. And, and of course, Danny was a school teacher to begin with, and he taught phys ed, so he was a natural to be teaching young children. And Bruce used to come down on Saturday near the end of that class. He'd come around the middle of the class, and he would wait for Danny to finish. And then, oftentimes, the two of them would go out for uh, lunch or whatever, and, and they, I guess they would often go to other schools and they were going to bookstores and uh, they had the same sort of a search for, uh, for knowledge and, and finding old books in stores and so they liked going together and so Bruce would come down to the school sometime and wait for Danny to finish and then they would go out for the afternoon and whatever they were doing. And Danny was there teaching uh, these kids and I was leaning up against the, the wall watching. I, I think I was there because after Danny's class, it was an open workout, or maybe, maybe I, was, I, was, I was there to teach some private lessons or something. But I was leaning up against the wall on where the mat area ends, against the wall, and Bruce came in and was, sitting, was standing right next to me. And then next to him was one of the uh, parents of one of the kids who had just joined. Or maybe it was... Um, an adult who would come in to look at, to observe the class to see if he wanted his kid to join. I never found out wh which one it was. And uh, so Danny was teaching, and this guy who's standing right next to Bruce, every now and then he would mumble to himself, but loud enough, maybe where Dan could have heard him. But he would say things like, well, that'll never work. 
That kid's gonna get his gonna wind up on the school ground asphalt he tries at. And he wait for a little while and then he say the same kind of thing again. He said, he, that kick's never, he's never powering that kid. He don't kick like that. And, and he just, every now and then, he would just badmouth Dan. And uh, he's standing right next to him. And Bruce is saying nothing. He's just, but he's hearing it. And all of a sudden, Bruce just turned to this guy and he just took his two fingers and put them right under the guy's, right here, right under his throat. Jabbed it up into his neck. And with those two fingers, he led the guy outside. Uh, the door was uh, like five feet away, so he didn't go have to go that far. But he, he um, I guess he opened the door, he, he pushed the door up with his foot and walked outside with a guy. And uh, I didn't follow him. And no one did to my knowledge, but uh, a minute later, uh, Bruce walked back in. He just assumed his same position that he had on the wall. Continue to observe Danny's class. He never said anything about it. He just <laughs> was tired of hearing this guy. And uh, the, the guy was insulting Danny, who was teaching the class. And uh, Bruce took care of it. I don't know what this, what this guy uh, must have thought about all that. Because Bruce was not, this guy was a pretty big guy. And... Uh, so that was uh, uh, something that I vividly remember. Uh, and I would imagine Danny remembers it. A short while after uh, Bruce appeared at uh, MGM Studios and, and uh, met Ryan O'Neill, uh, Blake asked me if, uh, if I could have uh, asked Bruce if he would like to come up to uh, his house with uh, Julie Andrews. They lived together before they were married. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, give a demonstration. Uh, Julie had not met um, Bruce, and and uh, but I had talked about him, and Blake had talked about him, and so Blake said, "Why don't you have him see if uh, if Bruce can come up and and uh, and uh, kind of you know do a demonstration for Julie? She'd really love it." So I did, and uh, uh, the next weekend or so, Bruce arrived uh, with a bag of things, of equipment and different things he had. And we went up to the pool house, <clears throat> which kind of overlooked the, the main house. And Bruce got out his, his, uh, his various assorted gear, his, his focus, focus pads and his shields and all that. And uh, he was demonstrating uh, 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 trapping moves on me in a back fist. And he might have uh, done his, uh, you know, two finger push up, you know, the very explaining the difference between Kung Fu and, um, and, uh, martial arts, the mainstream martial arts system, Shotokan and the Japanese and so forth. And, and Julie was very interested because she was very into movement. She was a dancer and so she was very interested in what he was showing and saying. Uh, and then Bruce said to me, he said, um, why don't you do a sidekick? And he got the, uh, that, that uh, kicking shield of his and he, he held it and he asked me to, to kick the shield as hard as I could, which I did. I, I had my gi on, as a matter of fact, and uh, and uh, I I took a stance and I, I lunged into that thing and I kicked that that shield and I moved Bruce. I mean, I moved him a good you know three four feet, I guess. You know, I, I, he he moved. I had a pretty good sidekick, and of course Bruce looked Bruce looked at Blake and looked at me and then looked at, at Blake and Julie and said, "Well, you've been studying JKD," which was true. He had helped me with my sidekick, so th there, that was a truthful statement. And then he handed me the shield, and he said, now you hold this, and he, I, he said, I'll show you the sidekick, as I do a sidekick. And I got into my stance, and I held that, that shield in front of me, and he said, he asked me if I was ready, I nodded yes. And the next thing I saw was him coming at me, and he hit that shield that I was holding, and I gotta tell you, I was airborne. I had not held that shield for him prior to that. I'd held it after that, but not prior to that. There was, a, there was a, some footage of me on an A&E special where I'm in the backyard at, at the Bel Air house holding that shield. But he hit that shield, and I mean, I was, I was literally running backwards. The shield disappeared, and I couldn't catch up with myself. He kicked me the length of that swimming pool. And uh, I went from the shallow end to the, to the deep end where I fell into this... Uh, patch of wet ivy 
And I remember looking up and I was almost like seeing stars for a moment. And suddenly his face appeared on top over me and he said, are you all right? And I remember thinking to myself, thank God I had that shield. Had he kicked me without that shield, he would have broken every bone in my chest. I would have been dead. I mean, there's no way that my heart could have survived that, the, that kick. Uh, Blake, uh, uh, Ed Parker said that, uh, that Bruce Lee kicked like a horse, like a mule. And he did. The, the power that he could generate in that sidekick was uh, nothing I had ever experienced. I'd kicked heavy bags, and we'd had some guys in Kempo that could kick a heavy bag and could move that heavy bag, but not like Bruce. Uh, that sidekick of his was uh, um, the power that he generated in that sidekick. Man, his size was something I had never seen before, and I'd never, certainly never felt before, and uh, that, that was uh, an afternoon I will never forget. Short while after that, uh, Blake Blake took a, a set of uh, ten uh, uh, private lessons from Bruce. He, he went over to Bruce's house on Roscommon, and he he took a, a set of ten private lessons. And he uh, he came back to the house one time when I was there, and he was carrying a board that was broken in half. And he was so proud that he had he had side kicked a shin kick, I guess it was, and had broke that board. It was a thick board. It wasn't a one-inch pine. I think it was Doug Fur. It was floor joist, and he, he broke that that board. But was, what was important to me was he said that Bruce Bruce got this out of me, that he couldn't have done this without Bruce getting it out of him to uh, to not motivate but to uh, almost ignite his inner energy to break that board. And then I heard about uh, later on, Julie told the story. She told it on somebody's uh, talk show, I guess it was. It's on YouTube somewhere, where Bruce had come over to, uh, to have lunch at the house. And uh, there were some other people there. And somebody asked Bruce what was the difference between boxing and I think it was boxing and kung fu or something. And Bruce, who was sitting down, suddenly said, well, here's the difference. And he jumped up in the air and he shot a sidekick out to the near the edge of the ceiling and popped it in the air and then sat back down and said, that's the difference. <laughs> I tell you, <clears throat> he was quite a showman. I mean, whenever he had the opportunity to be a showman, uh, he, he, he thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, if you were present with him uh, in, in, in his presence when he felt like, like uh, doing things like that, it was, uh, it, it was, uh, it was worth seeing. I, I don't recall whether Bruce had studied magic or sleight of hand or where he got, but he had a, a bag of sleight of hand tricks that he used to do. And uh, they were attention getters. And one of them was, one of the first things he did with me was he was uh, he told me to hold my hand out, which I did, I held my hand out. And he put, um, I, I think like a nickel in the palm of my hand. And then he stood back a little ways and he said, now when I come at you, I want you to grasp your hand and stop me from grabbing the nickel. I said, okay, do that. And uh, and uh, held my hand out and he asked, ready? Yeah, and he, he came at me so quickly and before I, I would grab my hand back and I'd open my hand and there was nothing there and he'd show me the nickel. And I said, let me, you know, let's, you know, let's go through that one again. And I held him, holding it like this and he's looking, all, boom, he's there and he, 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 oh, I open it again and the nickel's gone. His hand was that fast and just taking that nickel right out of the palm of my hand. I said, uh, he said, why don't you try it and do the best you can on this one? I don't think you're concentrating well enough. I said, okay. And I held my hand out. I put that nickel there again. And he, he said, are you ready? I said, yeah. And, and all of a sudden, boom, he was in and out. And I pulled my hand back and I could feel that nickel in my hand. And I just smiled. I said, I got it. Uh, I, I figured you out. I figured out how to, I, I got the, I got it. But, you know, I was so happy that I finally had, had grabbed that coin. He said, let me see. And I held it out, and it was a dime. And he held up the nickel. He had taken that nickel out of my hand and replaced it with a dime. I have a feeling that the dime was already in the hand that he, when he grabbed the nickel, the dime just dropped in my hand. I don't think it was a two deal. However he did it, uh, he did it. 
And I wound up with, uh, he replaced the nickel with a dime. I think it would took him, it's probably the same amount of time to do it without the dime or with it. But in any case, <laughs> the lesson was pretty clear to me. I mean, I just, I was just another time that I was just, I was just totally amazed. The power that he could generate in his hand, in his punches and so forth was, was really uh, quite exceptional. I know it at Black Belt Magazine, and I had seen him do this with others. With Black Belt Magazine, there was a guy that um, questioned uh, the power of his jab, and uh, Bruce would say, you know, that he could knock somebody out with his jab, and I, somebody either made a comment or he wanted to see what the power of the jab was or something. So Bruce got a focus glove and he put it on the guy's hand and he said, hold this up. And he, he went forward and he jabbed that that with his front hand jab. And the guy's hand and the focus glove took off and the energy from that focus pad going backwards when it reached the extension of his arm just pulled on his, on his shoulder and dislocated his shoulder. I had a similar uh, experience with him when, when I first met him. He gave me the same focus glove, but he held it out uh, so that it was vertical. I was holding it vertical with my arm outstretched. And he told me to drop in a horse stance, which I did. I dropped in a horse. And um, he said, he said, close your eyes. I said, okay. And I'm holding this thing out in front. I'm in a horse stance and I'm closing my eyes. And the next thing he said was, he said, imagine this is your face. And he hit that thing uh, uh, horizontally across that thing. and. I got to tell you, it felt like my whole rib cage got ripped out of him. I mean, it was really a powerful shot, and I and I did. I thought, my God, if he slapped me with his hand on the side of my face with the force that he delivered into that focus glove, well, I'd be knocked out, and maybe worse. I mean, uh, there was no question the power that he could generate was uh, in, for a man his size. Uh, was really extraordinary. One of the one of the uh, the demonstrations that he used to do occasionally, and I was with him a few times when he did it. And when the first time I saw it, I was very impressed. And after that, I just sat, sat back and said, "Oh, this will be fun." But every now and then, uh, a woman would ask him if he would be so kind as to show her a kung fu move that if her life were threatened or if she uh, was uh, being attacked or whatever it was, that she could use this kung fu move to save herself. You know, she said, could you show me something that I could work on and practice and, and uh, that, that would help me in the event that my life was threatened? And Bruce would, uh, would say, well, yeah, I can, as a matter of fact, but let's, uh, let's see how well you can do with it. And uh, so he would tell her to... to, to stand in a in a horse stance to drop her to bend her knees and and to hold her hands out like so basically uh, you know six inches apart and then he stood away from her a few feet three four feet and he said now whatever i do uh if i make a move i kick if i punt, whatever i do to you just clap your hands and i'm you defeat me I'm defeated, whatever that is. This is the move I'm teaching you. You just clap your hands together. And whatever I do, I'm defeated if you clap your hands. And she understood. And he got back and he dropped into kind of a stance and he was frozen for a minute and he said, are you ready? And then he would just move his hand up like that and she would clap. And he'd say, ah, oh, it's very good. You just defeated me. Very good. Let's try it again. She'd get down, and she was a little more excited this time. She'd get the hands, and he would move his foot a little bit, and she'd clap her hands. He'd say, very good. You're getting better at that. Let's try it again. And he'd do it another couple of times, and she was smiling and very proud, and he said, oh, you've got great reflexes and great. Now, that's the move I've just taught you. Now let's test you and uh, see how good you are in a test to do this. I'm going to really focus and do this in a test. And she got down, and... She'd have her hands there, and you could see the focus. Her focus, she was really on, and this was going to be the test. And he'd say, are you ready? And she'd say, yes, yes. And all of a sudden, he would just spring at her and scream at her and flail his arms overhead, and she would just drop down and throw her hands overhead, and she'd stand up, and she had this look on her face like she'd just seen a ghost, and she was, my God. 
what was that? And he looked at her and very calmly said, whatever happened to this? And the point was made. And he would tell her, he said, I can show you a move, one or two moves. I can show you something, but in, in a crisis, you're not going to remember it unless you train, unless you embody it within you. That's how he made his point, and it was always wonderful. And I, I remember we used to have those things when I was a kid. You would, you would get these uh, lesson plans from Joe Weider and uh, Charlie Atlas weightlifting, and they'd be in the comic books. There'd be a little ad in the comic book, send away, send away a nickel or 10 cents, and you would get three great kung fu moves or a judo chop or something, and it would save your life, and you would know these deadly blows. I guess that's where people got that idea. Thank you.